Hello and welcome back. In this video, we are going to talk about switched capacitor circuits and in particular their application to the implementation of active filters. Uh, in the type of circuits uh, that we have seen to implement active filters, typically those circuits are comprised of op-amp ICs, either one or, or more, and uh, discrete circuit components, resistors, capacitors, inductors, uh, typically, resistors and capacitor implementation tend to be the most widely used in the practice because of the practical limitations of inductors. Sometimes there arises the need to design of an active filter uh, using a monolithic IC without uh, having discrete components around the IC. Now, in um, IC technology, we are limited because we basically the large components will take up large areas and so we are limited in terms of area if we want to implement the type of components that we have seen uh, in active filters you know resistors in the order of uh, tens or hundreds of kilo ohms capacitors in the range of um, picofarads to, nan to even nanofarads uh, and those are components that are impractical to implement in, in integrated circuits in integrated circuits we would like to keep um, our resistor values, if possible, to less than around 10 kilo ohms, our capacitor values to um, less than around 100 picofarads. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, one, the, the space, but also another limitation that arises with integrated circuits is um, the poor um, uh, absolute tolerance of components, meaning it's difficult in integrated circuits to get good accuracy of a, a good absolute accuracy of component values. It is much easier to get good matching between components than it is to get good accuracy at, of an absolute value. And since the type of circuits that we have studied to implement filters uh, are relying on the absolute accuracy of components uh, for the accuracy of the gain, for the accuracy of the kind of frequency, etc., with the circuit parameters, uh, they're not so suitable for IC implementation because when we implement those types of circuits in ICs, we are going to be losing in the accuracy of components and therefore we are going to be um, also losing in the accuracy of, say, the cutoff frequency, for example. So the, the solution, or one of the solutions to these um, practical limitations of the circuits that we have seen so far for implementation in IC technology is the use of switch capacitor circuits. And as we are going to see in this video, the um, using the switch capacitor circuits, using this new design uh, procedure or this new type of circuit, we're going to be able to implement the same filters or filters with the same response by using exclusively small capacitors and uh, large resistors, or I should say large equivalent resistors. And you may think, well, you just said that the use of large resistors is impractical, um, but the trick that we're going to be playing is that we're going to be using switched MOS transistors, uh, we're going to get them to behave as resistors. And so we're, when I say we're using small capacitors and large resistors, we really should say we're using large equivalent resistances. Those resistors are being implemented basically using MOS transistors. So let's take a look at how that works. Mm, I have um, drawn here a resistor connected to uh, a voltage differential to different voltages, uh, V1 and V2. Let's assume that V1 is greater than V2. Uh, in that case, by Ohm's law, we have a, a difference in voltage across a resistor. A current will flow through that resistor, such that the current is going to be equal to uh, the difference in voltage V1 minus V2 divided by the resistance. Or likewise, we can say that uh, the value of that resistance is equal to V1 minus V2 divided by the current. And that's just by Ohm's law. Uh, right underneath, I have drawn an implementation of, of an equivalent resistor using a switch capacitor topology, which basically consists of uh, two MOS transistors, in this case, N-channel MOS, uh, M1 and M2. Um, and a capacitor C, and then the gates of those MOS transistors are being driven by two um, complementary and non-overlapping uh, clocks, um, 
units. So the clock signals will be phi1 and phi2. And I have uh, drawn on the side uh, what the clock signals look like, so we can see that they are indeed complementary. So when uh, phi1 is high, uh, phi2 is low, and vice versa. And they are now overlapping, meaning they are, the edges happen at the exact same uh, time position. Uh, I have labeled the period of those clocks as uh, T clock, CLK. Uh, and the reason why I've, I haven't called it TC is so that it, we don't get confused with kind of frequencies because we could also talk about the frequency of the clock. So that way, uh, the clock signals I will just call, uh, refer to as CLK. Uh, so we can see that when phi is high, uh, transistor M1 turns on, and since phi 2 is low, M2 is off, and vice versa. When uh, phi 1 goes low, transistor M1 turns off, and transistor M2 turns on because phi 2 goes high. So again, assuming that uh, V1 is greater than V2, Let's imagine that um, we start looking at what happens at a, at a point in time, which I will label here as T1. So at T1, uh, basically what's happening is that my phi1 is going high, meaning my transistor M1 is turning on. And therefore, uh, there is a conductive path so that capacitor C charges to a voltage level of V1. So C charges up to V1. And then at the later point in time, at the half period, V2, uh, the opposite happens. Uh, phi1 goes low and phi2 goes high. Therefore, M2 is on and uh, C uh, discharges to a voltage level of V2 for capacitor C. I'm oh, sorry, for transistor M2. Discharges down to V2. And so um, understanding current as the rate of charge per unit time, we can see that there is uh, uh, an amount of charge transferred during this process, um, meaning initially the capacitor charges up to V1, so there is charge being transferred, and then it discharges to V2, so there is charge being transferred. Uh, the amount of charge that is transferred during the process is uh, Q, will be equal to, by the capacitor equation, the capacitance times delta V, V1 minus V2. And because we have a uh, uh, transfer of charge in an amount of time, which in this case will be the, the equivalent to the period of the clock, uh, we can define a current, an equivalent current, which is basically the delta Q. I'm going to call this delta Q. Delta Q delta T, which is basically C V1 minus V2 divided by uh, one clock period, TCLK. And if we wanted to express it in terms of uh, frequency, we could also do that. Uh, this current, since the frequency is the inverse of the period, we could also express this as FCLK times capacitance C times V1 minus V2. And if we compare this expression for for current uh, with the one that we wrote above for, for Ohm's law, I equals V1 minus V2 divided by R, we can see that um, in this case, we're going to say our I equivalent, we can see it's also proportional to a voltage differential divided by an equivalent resistance. And that equivalent resistance, we can see that it is equal to the inverse of FCLK times the capacitance C. And so, what, what the principle of operation that we have seen is that by using a pair of MOS transistors with um, a clock, a two-phase clock signal, 
and a, a capacitor, we're able to implement an equivalent resistance. And that is the whole uh, operation principle of switch capacitor filters or switch capacitor uh, systems. Is that we're able to simulate resistance by um, alternately charging and discharging MOS transistors, or rather charging and discharging a capacitor uh, using MOS transistor switches. Uh, and so this is our principle of operation, I should say. For most transistors, is uh, we are simulating equivalent resistance by charging, discharging. A capacitor um, between two voltage levels. And that's the important thing that we need to remember. Now, how does it apply in the practice to the type of uh, filters that we're trying to implement? Well, let's try to see that through a practical example. Let's imagine that I have um, a, a resistor, an equivalent resistance that I'm trying to implement. So we're going to implement or simulate, I should say. An R equivalent of 100 kilo ohms, and that's pretty high, but resistances in the in the tens uh, of kilo ohms are not uncommon in the design of active filters. Uh, and so I will have to basically, if I look at the expression for my equivalent resistance, it is inversely proportional to both the frequency of my clock and uh, my capacitance. And so I basically have to choose a capacitor, and from there I can calculate the frequency of my clock or vice versa, if I have a particular clock frequency that I need to use, I will be able to calculate what capacitor I need in order to implement that particular resistance. Um, in this case, let's imagine that I'm going to choose a capacitor, and um, for the sake of example, I'm going to choose one that is 40 picofarads. And from there, I can figure out if my equivalent resistance is equal to 1 over the frequency of the clock times my capacitance, then the frequency of clock that I need in this case will be 1 over my equivalent resistance times capacitance C, which is 1 over 100K times 40 pico or my clock frequency is equal to 250 kilohertz. And so notice that we have been able to implement a fairly large value of resistor, 100 kilo ohms, using a very reasonable capacitor, 40 picofarads, um, and a reasonable clock frequency. I'm going to write here the application that we want to see. It's going to be for active filters. Why is that so? We're going to see how um, we're going to be able to implement active filters using exclusively capacitors and transistors. Um, so essentially we're going to use, you know, active filters require the use of op-amps and capacitors and resistors, and so we're going to be leaving the capacitors alone, but replacing those resistors with this uh, switch capacitor combination, basically one capacitor and two most transistor switches. And we'll see that in the next video. Thank you.